Hey guys, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, I do weekly uploads on some of the most horrendous and mysterious cases around the world. So if you're a true crime fan like I am, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. Before we get started today, I do want to take a quick second to give you guys a speculation warning because although I have tried to weed out the opinions and only use factual information, we have to be mindful that this is still the internet and even if you may think so, not everything you see is 100% true. Alright guys, so for once, we're not going to one specific place because it happened in a bunch of different places, so buckle up. For the sake of today's video, I guess we're going to continue on our serial killer series so that we can go over the timeline of the infamous Ted Bundy. Bundy was for sure one of the most notorious criminals in the late 20th century and honestly, even up until now. His real name was Theodore Robert, and he was born on December 24, 1946, in Burlington, Vermont. Bundy claimed that he had a pretty normal childhood, you know, two loving parents that did the best they could with him and his siblings, and he included that there was no abuse of any kind. Bundy stated in an interview that he felt like violent pornography at a young age is what helped mold him into who he became. Let's go back then to those roots. First of all, you, as I understand it, were raised in what you consider to have been a healthy home. Absolutely. You were not physically abused. You were not sexually abused. You were not emotionally abused. No, no way. I, and that's part of the tragedy of this whole situation is because uh, I grew up in a wonderful home with two dedicated and loving parents, uh, one of uh, five brothers and sisters. A home where we as, our, as children were the focus of, of my parents' lives, where we regularly attended church, uh, two Christian parents who did not drink, they did not smoke, there was no gambling, there was no physical abuse or fighting in the home. I'm not saying this was leave it to beaver. It wasn't a perfect home. No, no, I don't know that such a home exists, but it was a fine, solid Christian home, and nobody... Uh, I hope no one will try to take the easy way out and to try to blame or otherwise accuse my, uh, my family of contributing. A lot of the issues Bundy had as a child stemmed from him being so shy in school and also from his family moving around a lot, making him a great target for bullies. However, later in life was a completely different story. He was said to be very intelligent and have great social skills, which enabled him to enjoy a successful college career. Also during that time, he was able to build emotional connections with a few women, but despite any of this, he sexually assaulted and killed many young women all the way from Washington to Oregon, Oregon to Colorado, Colorado to Utah, Utah to Florida, and all between the years 1974 and 1978. Keep in mind during this video that Bundy was a law student attending the University of Puget Sounds Law School, all while committing these crimes. It all started on January 4th, 1974, when Bundy broke into the home of Karen Sparks, who was a student at the University of Washington. In a Netflix documentary, Sparks said, quote, He came into my home, took a bed frame off my bed, and smashed my skull. And he probably used the same bed frame and smashed it into my vagina and into my bladder. My bladder was totally split, end quote. Karen was one of the few victims to survive, but unfortunately, she did suffer from permanent brain damage, loss of vision, and she heard a constant ringing in her ears for years. Not long after that incident, on February 1st, 1974, Bundy committed his first proven murder, and it was yet another student that attended the University of Washington, but this time, Linda Healy disappeared from her off-campus home in the early morning hours. Lieutenant Pat Murphy was the one to investigate Linda's room, and when he went down there, he was surprised because the room was left very neat, and also her bed was carefully made, which struck Linda's roommates as odd because she never made her bed on the day she went into work, and she never put the blanket over the pillow, she always put the pillow on top. Investigators would soon find out why the blanket was pulled over the pillow though, because when they pulled back the blanket, both the pillow and the head area of her sheets were covered in blood. They then proceeded to comb over the rest of her room and guess what they found? Her nightgown, blood all around the ring of the neck, neatly hung up in her closet. 
Unfortunately, this case would leave authorities baffled until 1975 when Linda's skull was discovered along with several other bodies just outside Seattle in Taylor Mountain Forest. But still, there would be countless more assaults and disappearances before police would make a potential connection between Bundy, Linda, and Karen. On July 14, 1974, Bundy claimed not one, but two victims in the same day. And again, it was two college students, both Janice Ott and Denise Naslin, both vanished from Sammamish State Park. This time, there was a witness, and the witness's name was Janice Graham. Graham recalled a young man named Ted with his arm in a sling, asking her to help him carry his sailboat, which she agreed to initially because she thought it was in the parking lot, but when she realized he wanted her to get in his Volkswagen with him, she refused. So this brings us to August 30th, 1974, when Bundy left his job at the Emergency Services Department in Olympia, Washington, and moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, where he would resume his studies at the University of Utah Law School. And it didn't take long for him to get back to his regular duties because on November 8th, 1974, he strikes again and again. It was two young girls in one day. He posed as a Murray police officer and lured 18-year-old Carol Durant from the mall to his tan Volkswagen Beetle where he attempted to apply handcuffs to her, but instead she escaped and somehow got away. I'm guessing because he wasn't successful with her, his needs weren't met, so later that day, authorities learned that 17-year-old Deborah Kent disappeared after leaving a high school play to go pick up her younger brother. In the school parking lot where she disappeared from, investigators found a key on the ground, which happened to be the key that fit the handcuffs used on Carol earlier that day. I guess after that, he decided to take it to Colorado because on January 12, 1975, a 23-year-old nurse named Karen Campbell disappeared from her hotel in Snowmass, Colorado after leaving the lobby to get a magazine from the room she was staying in. Sadly, her body was found a few weeks later in a snowbank outside of the resort village. And this brings us to August 16, 1975, which is about seven months after the last incident, when Highway Patrol Sergeant Bob Hayward stopped a tan Volkswagen Beetle that had been lingering outside a home in Granger, Utah. Hayward pulled Bundy over and searched the car in which he found a ski mask, a crowbar, an ice pick, and guess what else? The handcuffs. After Sergeant Hayward had searched my car and called in another officer, called in other, another officer to come in, and after my car had been thoroughly searched by the other officers, Detective Andract approached me at that time and informed me that he was going to seize certain items, items from my car and told me that he was going to attempt to get a warrant or a complaint or something of that type uh, uh, against me for possession of burglary tools. At that point, Sergeant Hayward uh, and or another officer, I'm not sure, searched me for the first time, handcuffed me, put me in his vehicle, read me the rights off a little car he carried on his console, and drove me downtown to the Salt Lake County Jail. So, of course, Bundy was arrested, but he was only charged with evading police, and that isn't enough to detain him for a long period of time, so they had to let him go. But fortunately, on October 2nd, 1975, Carol Durant and two other women pointed Bundy out in a police lineup, so he was then arrested and charged with aggravated kidnapping. On March 1st, 1976, after a five-day trial, Bundy was found guilty of aggravated kidnapping, which carried a 1-15 to 15 year prison sentence, but on October 21st, 1976, investigators linked Bundy to the death of Karen Campbell through the discovery of her hair in his car, the use of his gasoline credit card in the vicinity the day she disappeared, and eyewitness accounts of him being at her hotel. From here, he is extradited to Aspen, Colorado in early 1977 to stand trial. If you thought it stopped there, you're wrong, because he was allowed access to the law library at the Aspen County Courthouse while being unshackled and unguarded for whatever reason, so he jumped from a second floor window and headed straight for the mountains. This led authorities on a six-day manhunt where Bundy is eventually found driving a stolen car and returned to custody. But again, he has another trick up his sleeve. 
Even though he was moved to a more secure facility in Greenwood Springs, Colorado, Bundy purposely lost weight so that he could squeeze through an opening in the cell, then cut through his ceiling and into the duct system so that he could escape again, and that is exactly what he did. On December 30th, 1977, he took all the steps, cut through the duct system, and ultimately exited the facility into an empty apartment of a prison worker, changed his clothes, and was out once again. Although this time, he left Colorado altogether and ended up landing himself in northern Florida. Obviously, he wasn't out long before he would strike again, and in fact, it was only about two weeks. On January 15, 1978, Bundy broke into Florida State University's Chi Omega sorority house at 3 o'clock a.m. and strangled the life out of Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy and beat Kathy Kleiner and Karen Chandler with a club-like object before fleeing. Bundy then entered a home that was a few blocks away from Chi Omega and brutally assaulted another student, which was Cheryl Thomas. Kleiner, Chandler, and Thomas were all able to survive their injuries, but unfortunately, none of them were able to identify or describe their attacker. On February 9, 1978, Bundy would attack one more time, and this time, it was a girl significantly younger than his previous victims. 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, disappeared in the middle of the day from Lake City Junior High School in Florida, and her body was found two months later under a shed in Suwannee River State Park, but it wasn't until February 15, 1978, that Bundy would be arrested for good. Pensacola Police Officer David Lee noticed the car driving with no headlights on at 1.30 a.m., so he ran the plates, and the plates came back to a stolen car. So, of course, he pulls over the car, but he finds himself in a violent scuffle before subduing the driver. At first, Bundy was unwilling to give his identity, but he eventually revealed himself as the FBI wanted Ted Bundy. On June 25, 1979, Bundy stood trial and it was reportedly the first trial to be televised nationally. The trial started with Bundy immediately complaining to Judge Edward Coer about the conditions of his prison cell, which paved the way for a bizarre month of proceedings. During the trial, he bickered with his counsel, took the reins to cross-examine a police officer, and sat for testimony while referring to himself in third person. The first victim you saw was Kathy Kleiner? Yes, sir. Did you speak to her? No, sir, not directly. She was in shock or appeared to be in shock and was incoherent. So uh, talking to her would have been to no avail. And then you next encountered Karen Chandler. Yes, sir. Did you speak to her? Yes, sir. Can you recall that conversation? <clears throat> not word for word. The gist was that uh, she did not know what had happened. Um, she knew she was hurt, and she was concerned about uh, Kathy. You recall her telling you that you, she remembers the assailant being young? Objection. <clears throat> Restate the question. You recall her saying anything about whether she remembered being assaulted? No, sir. Um, I basically just inquired as to her uh, condition and uh, the seriousness of her injuries and how she felt. Next, you approached room four, is that correct? The room, I, according to my report, I remember to be room four, yes, sir. <clears throat> Your testimony, the door was closed? Yes, sir. How did you enter the room? I turned the door handle and pushed the door open. With the same hand? Or with, did you use one hand to put on the door handle, the other hand to push on the door? How did you enter? I turned the door. I let him in. <clears throat> turned the door handle with my left hand and pushed it open with my left hand. Then, to the best of your recollection, mm -hmm. step by step, if you can, officer, what did you do next? Step by step, use my right hand to turn on the light, uh, turn partially to my left, observe the young lady lying in the bed. I took one or two steps toward her 
and that's when I heard the house mother behind me. She told me the girl's name, Lisa, and I spoke to her. All right, now, were you wearing gloves? No, sir. Your hands were bare? Yes, sir. In the July 18, 1979 proceeding, despite the defense's objections to his testimony being permitted, forensic dentist Richard Suviron compared large pictures of Bundy's teeth to those of the bite marks found on one of the Florida State University victims and proclaimed them to be a match. On July 24, 1979, after a jury deliberated for less than seven hours, Bundy was found guilty of first-degree murder for Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy and was also found guilty of attempted murder for Kathy Kleiner, Karen Chandler, and Cheryl Thomas. The following week, Bundy was sentenced to die in Florida's electric chair, and after his sentencing was complete for those victims, on January 7, 1980, Bundy was brought to Orlando for his second murder trial within six months for the killing of Kimberly Leach. During his proceeding, there was testimony from a firefighter who seen the suspect lead the 12-year-old girl to his van, and there were matching clothing fibers found on both the alleged killer and the victim. So it's safe to say, one month later, the jury found Bundy guilty once again. On February 9, 1980, during the penalty phase of the trial, Bundy proposed to his girlfriend Carol Boone in the presence of a public notary rendering their marriage legal, but that didn't stop the jurors from recommending the death penalty for the newly married convict shortly after. November 17, 1986, just hours before his scheduled execution for killing Kimberly Leach, Bundy was granted a stay to determine his mental competency during his 1980 trial, but 13 months later, a district judge ruled that Bundy was fully competent for the trial and actually called him a diabolical genius. On January 23, 1989, after admitting to numerous murders, including three that predate the Northwest Spree of 1974, Bundy sits for an interview with evangelist James Dobson and blames his demented behavior on his addictions to alcohol and pornography. Difficult thing to describe. Uh, let me, uh, the, the sensation of the the, the, uh, of, of reaching that point where, you, where I knew that it, it was like something had, say, snapped, that I knew that, uh, that I couldn't control it anymore, that these barriers that, that I had, had been, uh, I had learned as a child uh, and had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming somebody. Would it be accurate to call out a uh, a frenzy, a sexual frenzy? Well, yes, it, that's one way to describe it. A compulsion, a, a, a building up of, of this destructive energy. Uh, again, uh, I, uh, another factor here that we, I haven't mentioned is the use of alcohol. But I think that, that what alcohol did uh, in conjunction with, let's say, my exposure to uh, pornography was alcohol reduced my inhibitions at the same time um, the, the the fantasy life that was fueled by pornography um, eroded them further later that evening the US Supreme Court rejected an emergency stay of execution for the prisoner by a 5-4 vote so on January 24th 1989 at the Florida State Prison Bundy was strapped into an electric chair that was nicknamed Old Sparky at around 7 o'clock a.m., and at 7.16 a.m., the notorious killer was declared dead by electrocution, drawing cheers from the estimated 200 people gathered outside. With that being said, we have reached the end of this video, guys. As always, thank you so much for watching all the way until the end. I cannot stress enough how much your support means to me, and if you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Also, leave me a comment on what case I should cover next. K-love you, bye!